receive our offering this morning. Let's be faithful in our giving. Uh, Brother Peebler, would you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Appreciate that good song. One quick announcement I failed to mention uh, for the ladies. There's the uh, Christian Womanhood magazine that several of you get. And so that sign-up sheet is going around. If you don't get this magazine, uh, this is a tremendous magazine, a lot of good articles for ladies. And um, it's only $20 for the entire year. That's 12 magazines for the year. And they'll, they come to the church, and then Miss Angie gets those to the ladies that order them every month. And we need to sign up and get that placed for next year by the beginning part of December so that you can get that magazine in January. I have two extra magazines. Would, would, it some, would one of the ladies like one to look at, or you can have it? Uh, Dylan, come here real quick. If you would give one to Miss Essel. Anybody else? You say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'd like one to look at, or maybe you do, and you'd like to have it. All right, and it, just get with Miss Angie and get signed up, and you get the money to her, and we'll get those ordered here in just a couple of weeks. I'm going to ask my boys to come. We're going to sing a song this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we'll uh, come back and get ready for the, the preaching this morning, but uh, this is the the Miller Boys Quartet today, all right? So 
Uh, I don't know that we've sang Just Us Fellas very often. I'm trying to remember when, when we have last, but uh, anyway. You can be turning to Ephesians chapter 2 if you want to get a head start on the scripture reading. But we'll sing this song here with a Thanksgiving theme. I've got so much to thank him for. Sometimes while I'm on this way, I kneel and to stop and say, Lord, thank you for all you've given me. And one day I'll reach heaven shore and please let me kneel once more. I've got so much to thank him for. So much to thank Him for, so much to praise Him for, you see, He's been so good to me, and when I think of what He's done and where He has brought me from, I've got so much to All right, Ephesians chapter number two this morning, and that sure is the truth, that song. I love Thanksgiving. I love this holiday, maybe my favorite holiday. I think it'd be a tie for me between Easter and Thanksgiving it would be uh, my favorite holidays uh, just because of the reason behind them. I love Christmas. Don't get me wrong. Christmas is a great time to celebrate the birth of Christ, uh, but become way too commercialized for me, and we lose the meaning of it. But Thanksgiving, you can be thankful, and I sure thank the Lord for my family, for uh, my boys, for my girl, amen, my girls, uh, my two girls, and of course this church means so much to us as well. But uh, praise the Lord. Let's stand, Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read one verse, and that is verse number 10. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That phrase there in the first part of that verse, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works. I want to preach a message with this title this morning. He's still working on me. You say, preacher, you already preached that message. Well, I did, but that was just part one. And so we're going to continue with this thought. There's so many good truths uh, nestled down in this, this, uh, these verses. And uh, he's still working on me. Let's pray and then I'll have you be seated. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be used for you. Lord, as Christians, our whole goal in life should be to be used, Lord, to be a blessing to others, to be a help in the church, to be a witness for Christ, and Lord, we want to give our life to you. I need your help, Lord, this morning. You know my heart, and Lord, you know the thoughts and the preparation that's went into this. Lord, I pray that you would just bless. Now, help us to have Holy Spirit listening ears today that we might get what you'd have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you can be seated. I just want to recap briefly just a couple minutes of part one of this message as I preached a few weeks ago. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It's amazing as we think about the different types of processes that takes place when something is created. I mentioned and referenced woodwork a few weeks ago. And it's amazing the detail that goes into a lot of, uh, of antique type of piece of furniture and different things. Uh, we think about a potter, and I've preached the message before, clay in the potter's hands. And we think about the effort and the work that has to go into molding and making that piece of clay. And as a Christian, the Bible tells us that we are his workmanship. And I talked about the process that it takes to create something. We understand that God is working on us. God has a plan for us. Uh, however, God has given us a will. God has given us a free will to choose whether or not we will follow Him or whether or not uh, we'll do our own thing. And we talked about the process that takes place, and we talked about the talent that is involved in the process, and God has a talent, amen, that is needed to make you and I into what he wants us to be. But there was uh, some trouble along the way, and and, uh, we talked about different things. I'll not uh, re-preach that part. But today I want to point out uh, number two is the problem. The problem. Number one was the first part of the message, and I talked about the process. But then there is always the problem. And uh, if you say, well, what is the problem? Go look in the mirror and you'll find it. Amen. Uh, This old body, this old flesh is the problem. I want you to look at our text here again. And I want to back up and look at verses 8 and 9. And see how these verses tie into verse number 10. Uh, The Bible says in verse number 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That's an important word there it's not of yourselves um put my glasses back on it's the gift of god it's the gift of god not of works the bible says in verse 9 lest any man should boast we see something funny about mankind in verses 8 and 9 the first thing that we see the bible says that it's not of yourselves now when you stop and think about this and i'll get to the the context of this in a moment, we use this verse for, uh, for telling someone about how to go to heaven. And, and that's good, and we should use that. But it's interesting as you notice that word or phrase, not of yourselves. And you think, why would God throw that little phrase, not of yourselves, right into that part of Scripture? Because God knows who we are. God knows that there's a problem with this whole flesh. And that problem is ourselves. That problem is pride. That problem is my will. The problem is 
doing things the way that I want to do them. And he goes on to say in verse number 9, it's not of works either, not of things that you can do yourself, not of things that man can make with his hands. Many people would rather do it themselves than let God do it for them. Because we're human. We say, no, let me do it. You raise children. There comes a time in life when Delaney is in the kitchen helping with cooking breakfast. And I like to cook breakfast. And she'll come in, and I can remember when she was smaller, and she'd watch as I would crack those eggs and put them in the skillet. But there came a time when she said this, Hey, can I crack those eggs? That looks like fun. I think I could do that. And you know what takes place? She cracked the egg all right, and it went everywhere. I can do it myself. I, I think about the, uh, the, uh, the tea pitcher in the refrigerator. And we'll make a gallon of tea, and of course, we, we, we get it all the way to the top of that pitcher. We fill it up, and we make it. And it sits in there to cool down, and sure enough, one of the young ones wants a glass of tea. And you can see him reaching up on that shelf with that big old gallon pitcher, and you think, oh, no, this isn't going to be good. And I say, hey, let me help you with that. No, I can get it, Dad. I want to do it myself. And none, uh, sure enough, almost every time, a, a little bit will spill out into the shelf on the, in the refrigerator. Sometimes a lot will spill out. Folks have the idea, I, I want to do it myself. Many times in the Christian life, we have that same idea and attitude. Lord, I can do this. I'll do it myself. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. It's amazing, this very same thought, this very same problem with, with doing things my way, doing things how I want to do it. I can do it my own way. This same thought was prevalent from the very beginning of time. Genesis chapter 4, if you will notice, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. Uh, he was a shepherd, if you will. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. They had seen their parents sacrifice to the Lord, and that's the way that God set things up uh, to worship Him and to get atonement for their sins. And God had to kill that lamb in the, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve messed up. We remember that, the very first sacrifice. And He made them a, a, uh, 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 took the skin of that lamb and made them clothes to cover up. They had seen their parents. They knew it was right. But all of a sudden now we see that Cain brought the fruit of the ground wasn't a blood sacrifice. It was the corn that he had raised. It was the fruit that he had grew on those trees. But the Bible says Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. You know, he brought that little lamb, the, the best of the, uh, the lambs that he had, and he brought that to the Lord to sacrifice. And the Bible says in verse 4, The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, there was a difference in these two boys. Cain and Abel both had a sacrifice to give God. They both said, okay, we know we need to come and worship God. We know we need to sacrifice. But here's what took place. Cain said, I'm going to bring the fruit of my labor. This is what I have done. He brought the fruit, the Bible says, of the ground. This is what he had done. He had made this. And he chose to do things his own way. But you know what happened? Cain went down a dead-end road. And his offering, his sacrifice, got him nowhere. Why? Because he said, Lord, I'll do it my way. Oh, I think he had good intentions. 
But it wasn't God's way. The problem oftentimes is ourself. God wanted to do things His way. But man's efforts, man's idea of using my works and doing things my way has been a problem since the beginning of time. You see, here's what takes place. Stay with me now this morning. Here's what takes place. We as Christians, we have ideas. Now, I'm not talking about the world right now. I'm talking about to the church, to the Christian. We have ideas. We have plans in our life. We have goals. We have dreams. And then we begin to try to implement the ideas that, here it is now, that we have. And that we always want to be. We try to become the person that we always wanted to be. And unfortunately, that doesn't always turn out right. There's an old phrase that I can remember seeing on a bumper sticker back when I was a child. And that phrase said this, God is my co-pilot. You've probably seen that along the years. And I understand the meaning behind that, and probably folks had good intentions, but that's a flawed statement. As a child of God, as a Christian, God is to be the pilot. He's to be in the driver's seat, controlling every aspect of my life, leading and guiding me, helping to fashion and make me, and we're His workmanship. God has a plan. He's got a blueprint. He knows what He wants you and I to be. But the problem comes when I put God in the co-pilot seat and say, Lord, I've got this thing. Lord, I've got the ideas in mind of places I want to go. Uh, Lord, I've got some dreams of mine of things I want to be. And uh, I've got this, and I'm glad that you're next to me in case I get in trouble. That's what the co-pilot's there for. We say, I can handle the challenge. The reason that Men becomes a disaster is because that I'm my own workmanship. And we need to submit to being His workmanship and take our hands off the wheel. Let me give you several problems this morning or several things that help me to see why myself, why my own ideas are not a good thing in life. First of all, may we understand this morning that our approval doesn't matter. My approval, my stamp of approval on something doesn't really matter a whole lot. Now, think think about this as a Christian. By whose standards is my efforts defined? In other words, who do I look to and say, okay, if they're happy with me, then I must be doing something right. Now, first of all, is it myself? Uh, when, I, when I look to myself for approval, and as long as I'm happy, then everything must be okay. Or is it my family? As long as I'm making my family happy or the friends around me, who is judging the standard that I live by? When we have the idea of as long as I can get man's approval, then I'm headed down a road that's a problem. You see, our, our approval doesn't matter. Uh, think about this. When God made you, And He did, by the way. God created life. That's where life comes from. When God made you and when you began to grow to an age of being able to think and and kind of figure out in life where you want to go, God didn't one day come to me, Brother Kevin, as a teenager and say, Hey, let me ask you a question, Tim. Hey, what do you want to be? What, What do you want to be when you grow up? God didn't come to me and get my approval and say, okay, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. God had a plan for me from the day I was born. God knew me when I was in my mother's womb, and God said, here is something that He can do. God had a plan for my life. And can I say this morning, God had a plan for your life too. From the day that you were born, God knew you. And if we would walk in His plan, we'd turn out how God wanted us to. It's amazing. God doesn't have to get my permission to do anything. He's God. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 18, the Bible says in verse number 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. 
So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. God has an image that He wants you to be conformed to. God has a game plan for your life. He already knows what is good for you. Romans 9.20, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? I, I, I mean, listen, should we really go to God, the one that formed me? The one who has created me and has a plan for me and say, Lord, I don't think that's what I want to do. Our approval doesn't matter this morning. What does matter is that Christ is Lord of my life. You know, some of you military folks will understand this. When you enlist in the military, when you sign up, you pretty much sign your rights away. And you wait for what they call marching orders. And you get your marching orders. You get that letter that comes in the mail and says, Hey, listen, on such and such a date, uh, here's where you're going. Brother Carol, you know how that works. And they move you around the world wherever they want you to go. You follow their marching orders. Now, I think as a Christian, if God is truly the Lord of my life, and I live my life to please Him, then when He gives me marching orders, guess what? You better start marching. What has God given you in your life? Uh, God has that plan. He's got that will. He is wanting to mold you and make you into what He wants. But I don't have the right attitude when it comes to this approval on my life. And the problem is what takes place, and it took place in the life of the Israelites, Israelites so many times. Judges 21, 25, the Bible says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When we take things into our own hands, it's amazing how we make a mess of things. That's the problem. We see our approval doesn't matter. Uh, another problem, and Something that will help us understand the problem is this. Our goal, number two, our goal is inaccurate. Our goal in life is not accurate. You say, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. Men strive for goodness, but God's will is perfection. You know what God wants me to be in my life? To be like Jesus. Perfection. Perfection. But sometimes, as humans, we just settle for goodness. And when we compare these things, when we compare man's goodness, and when we compare perfection of Jesus Christ, my best is so far from what Jesus Christ is. Uh, our goal is so far off. If we just try to live a good life, listen, our goal is not accurate this morning because what we should be aiming for is to be like Jesus. Here's what we want today. We want to be a better and improved version of me. But God's will is for us to be like His Son. And we hear this phrase all the time. I see it all the time with people and, and in churches and they, they make this statement. It says this, I'm living my best life. There's nothing wrong with living a good life, living the best you can. But the motto, that phrase is sweeping our churches. And people get satisfied with just living a good life and other, uh, rather than living a life that is pleasing to Christ. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. God wants you and I to live His life. His goal, His aim is for you and I to be like Jesus. We see the contrast between man's works and God's works in our text, Ephesians chapter 2. Two, let me get back here. 
We understand that God's works has already been finished and accomplished. That was on the cross of Calvary. Our works are referred to as works. Notice in verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 8, or verse number 9, not of works. Then this is talking about the works of man. Uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. And God is referred to in verse number 11, I'm sorry, verse number 10, that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And there's just an interesting contrast that when it's of myself, it's just works. But when I would allow Jesus to come into my life and to be His workmanship, those works can change into the good works that He wants me to do. Just an interesting thought there of how the word works is used. We understand in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the Bible says, We are all as an unclean thing, and our righteousness are as filthy rags. The best that I can do in my life. Listen, the very goodness that I can produce of myself. And if I would say I'm living my best life, the Bible says my goodness is as filthy rags. Do you understand the goal in life is not to live my best life? The, the goal in life is to not live a life of goodness, but the goal in life is to be like Christ. Our goal is inaccurate. Number three, our ability is insufficient. Our ability is insufficient. The trouble that we have is sometimes our approval is misplaced. Our goal isn't right. And the trouble we have is I don't even have the ability to become what God wants me to be. You understand, I need God. I need God. When we come to the place in life where we understand that we need God more than we need anything, uh, we're starting to figure it out. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I need God. The more I know I need God. The more I realize my insufficiencies. The more of a failure that I feel, the older I get, I think, Lord, why in the world would you give me another chance and a second chance? But we need God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Do you understand what that's saying? The foolishness of God, the weakness of God, is better than the strongest of man. We can't even compare. I mean, listen, when we understand that we have God on our side, when we, we need Him and He's on our side, Hey, listen, we're beginning to travel down the path of victory in the Christian life. The song says, my family has sung this song, when compared to God, everything's small. There's no giant that compares at all to the Holy One who sits upon the throne. My family's surprised I remember the words of that song. <laughs> I always forget words. Hey, listen, God is who we need this morning. Do you claim that in your life? Is He all that you want? Is He all that you need? The Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We're not even on the same wavelength as God. And when we say, my ability is good enough, I think I've got this figured out, we're not even coming close. We need God in life. And then number four, our agenda is flawed. Our agenda, it kind of goes along with the other points, but our agenda. Uh, you say, what's our agenda? Well, man has an agenda. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 6, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Man has an agenda of this. As long as I can get a pat on the back, I'm okay. As long as people will applaud me every once in a while, then th th that's okay. That's my agenda in life. I'm looking for the approval of man. 
The Bible says everybody, everybody is going to proclaim his own goodness. Now you ask anybody and they'll tell you their best qualities. God said, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for a faithful man. Uh, the Bible says in our text, verse number 9, it's not of our works. Why? Because if it's our works, the only thing that we're looking for is a pat on the back. The only thing that we're looking for is uh, that, that, uh, that, that pride that wells up inside of us and says, look what I've done. Our agenda is completely flawed. The Bible says if it's our own works, we'll begin to boast of that. But God's agenda is this. In 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, here it is now, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. God's agenda for you and I, listen, it's not that folks should look at me and say, Look at how good they are. Look at what they've accomplished. But God's agenda is that we'd show forth the praises of Him, that we would just return all glory to God and say, I couldn't do it without Him. If there's anything good in my life, it's all because of Jesus Christ. <laughs> As a Christian, though, we're real good with working on the outside. We're real good with putting on that suit and tie, aren't we? We're real good with putting on our Sunday best and going to church and fooling everybody. You know what I call Christians that are like that? The, a modern day Pharisee. We sure look good on the outside, but you know what you're struggling with on the inside. And the problem is you want to fool everybody. You want people to look at you and say, look how good they are. But when we allow God's agenda to take place, we begin to be changed from the inside out. The heart gets right with God. We say, Lord, I need you. My ability is not anything that, that, that can get the job done. Lord, I need you. Uh, Lord, I, I want to return the praises to you, give you all the thanks for what you've done. And when you begin to be changed from the inside out, the heart will begin to be what it needs to be, and then the outside will take place. The outside will follow. I was going through some things in my office this week, just beginning to go through some boxes and and uh, try to weed out some of my files. And I came across a box that I guess I've not seen in a long time, many, many years. And it's a box of some of my high school work. I, I just have a box that, that was in storage. And, and I said, I wonder what's in here. And as I started going through it, I, I, I forgot that I had this box. <clears throat> and I found this, and I want to... Include it in the part of the message this morning. I had an assignment. I went to a Christian school at my church, and I had an assignment in our Bible class to write a paper. And I wrote this paper when I was 16 years old. The title of it is God's Plan for Me. That's, that was the title of the paper. And uh, our, our teacher was tough. We had to type this thing out. It had to be spaced just right. Had to have all this index page and a bibliography page, all these things. And I'm so thankful that years ago as a 16-year-old boy that I had parents that loved me, took me to church. I had teachers, Sunday school teachers that loved me and invested their life into me. A Christian school teacher that I'll be forever indebted to, his name is Calvin Schultz. And his dear wife, Catherine, just poured their life into us students. Much like uh, Brother Bell for this church. Many people know Brother Bell. That was Calvin Schultz, and he was there through my high school years. His dear wife was a jewel. She went home to be with the Lord uh, many years ago. She had gotten cancer as a young, young woman, but... 
The first part of this paper just dealt with my salvation testimony. I won't read over that. But the second part of this paper is what I want to read today. And how it just fits with this thought of God's workmanship. I start off with a poem that says, When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and He shows me His plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been, had He had His way, and I see. And that's a sobering thought. When I stand at the judgment seat of God, and maybe His plan is revealed to me of what He wanted me to become as a Christian, and I stand there and I say, Oh my, here's what could have taken place. I wrote this, I hope that this will not be my life poem when I get to heaven. I hope that I don't block Christ out of my life. This was a 16-year-old boy I wrote this. I hope I don't block Christ out of my life and turn my back on Him. Matthew 26, 39 says, And He went a little farther and fell on His face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. We need to give our life to God to do whatever He wants to do with us. And then when He tells us what He wants, then do it. We need to have a willing heart towards God's will. The only way we'll find out what God wants and do it is if we want to. Mark 3.35 says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. If we all do God's will, then we'll be one big happy family. When we do God's will, we should not get so busy doing it that we forget why we're doing it. And then I included another poem, The Master Spoke. It says, The Master spoke, but I scarcely heard, above the noise and the din, of hurrying feet and hammer stroke. I was building a house for Him. Then He took me aside and He taught me this, while earthly things grew dim, He would rather a place in this heart of mine than the house I was building for Him. When I get to heaven, I want Jesus to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God's plan for me. I'm so thankful that I've tried as a Christian to obey the Lord. I've failed many, many times. But can I ask you today, What's God's plan for you? God wants to make something beautiful of your life. God wants to continue building and working on this church and continue to make it into what He wants it. We've got to allow Him to do it. And when we get in the way, that's where the trouble is. We have the wrong motives. We have the wrong agenda. Can I say this morning, we need the Lord. I want to ask my wife to come. I I told her I might do this. I didn't know for sure, but I think I'm going to. Take your psalm book and turn to page 432. I want you to see the words to this song. And I'm going to to sing it uh, here. It's, It's just a great song. And it helps us to remember of who we are and why we're here. We're created to be His workmanship. He's got a plan for you to reach those with the gospel of Christ, to be an influence to those around you, to be like Jesus. And when we really think of what we have in life, it's really not ours. It all belongs to Him. And uh, sometimes we need to be reminded of these things. I'll sing this song, but I want you to to think about these words. And uh, if you can catch the tune on the chorus or something, uh, feel free to to join in with me. But, uh, But I'll sing this song. The things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus.
us only let me use them to brighten my life so remind me remind me dear lord roll back the curtain of memory now and then show me where you brought me from and where i could have been remember i'm human and humans forget so remind me remind me dear lord well, i like this verse and it's uh oh it's just what we need our goodness is nothing but i'm thankful that his goodness he loved us in his son that's that's priceless amen that's everything and i'm so thankful that uh, he loved me that second verse, nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands. Yet He chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why he loved me, I can't understand. <clears throat> Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, uh, I'm not where I need to be, but he said, thank God not where I used to be. As we live the Christian life, oh, listen, we've got a long way to go. But remember, along the road, we are His workmanship. You allow God to work in your life. And you say, Lord, I want to strive to be like Christ every step of the way. And you'll begin to see how God can take a nothing, make it into something for Him. Can I tell you, somebody needs you. Somebody needs you. Young people, somebody needs you. Darius, somebody needs you. Your family needs a young man that will say, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. Kenzie, somebody needs you. Ari, somebody needs you. Caleb, somebody needs you to say, I'm going to be as all I can be for Jesus. And you keep praying uh, with those teammates every chance you get you keep being a witness for jesus darren somebody needs you son you got you got one more year at home one more and then and it's off the the, the eagle's kicking you out of the nest and you got to learn to fly ain't staying with dad and mom amen we'll send you a, send you a, a, a box of hot dogs and say here you go get out of here now, I'm serious. It all becomes real when you turn 18. I hit the road when I was 18 on my own. Off to Bible college, paying my own bills now. Somebody needed me. As adults, people need us. My kids need me. Lord, help me never quit on God. There, the, the temptation's been there, folks. It's been there for you. Just because you're a pastor doesn't mean that those same temptations aren't there. That's so all oh, I'm glad. 20 years into the ministry, still going. I want to quit. Why? My grandkids are going to need me one day. Good night. 
Brother Chester this week, faithful all those years. Somebody needed him, all those grandkids. The patriarch of the family is now in heaven. And his life will live on, I promise you, his memory lives on because of the faithfulness. And so let's be reminded like Paul, thank God I'm not where I used to be, but i still got a long ways to go. Father, thank you for this message this morning. I don't really know why you wanted me to preach this, this uh, thought, and it just continued on. Lord, I, I kind of wanted to preach on Thanksgiving today. But Lord, I guess we'll save that for Tuesday night and have a special service. Lord, I pray that you'd help each young person today, each adult in here today, to just take our hands off the wheel and say, Lord, get over here in the driver's seat and we're just going to go along for the ride. Wherever you take me, that's where I'll go. And Lord, whatever you want to conform me to be, that's what I'll be. I'll not fight you anymore on it. I'll allow your perfect will and your perfect way to take place in my life. Lord, I pray it should work this morning in the hearts of the people here. In Christ's name I pray, amen. If you will, stand to your feet this morning. No one looking around. We're going to close with our prayer time. I don't know why, but I feel this morning there's somebody in here that needs to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to take my hands off of my life today and I'm going to let you put your hands upon my life and make me into what you want. I'm going to go ahead and scrap my agenda. I'm going to go ahead and scrap my plans. Maybe it's a young person. Maybe it's an adult. But I've got an overwhelming burden this morning for our church. God wants to do something. But if we stand in the way, He'll not do it. We've got to let Him. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's the very first step in becoming what He wants you to become. If you've not put your faith in Jesus for salvation, you're trusting in your own goodness, your own works, you'll not make it to heaven. The Bible says there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And if you doubt this morning, you say, I think I'd go to heaven, but I'm not 100% sure. If I could beg you, I'd do it. I'd get on my knees and I'd beg you to trust Christ, but it has to be your decision. Would you step out of your seat in just a moment and come down to the front and say, Preacher, I need to give my life to Christ. I want to trust Him as my Savior. It'll be the best day of your life. I just ask you this morning, obey God. As the piano plays, why don't you come this morning? The altars are open. Just say, Lord, I trust your plan. Lord, I need you. Folks are coming this morning. Why don't you come? All over the building, folks are stepping out.